Welcome to Blockchain Asia. I'm your host for this week, Gustavo Liu. And here with my co-host, uh, Michelle Wonderland. Hello. Hi, Michelle. Hi. How are you? I'm doing great, but I didn't have the day at the block show today. So I'm excited to be here to hear about. So I went there like the whole day. I was like running out yeah. in the morning. Today, the day was just absolutely crazy. And um, I was there hunting for guests. Um, met quite a few very interesting people. Yeah. And I came across something very, very uh, unusual. Somebody who I am very excited to introduce. So we have, le- I'm going to embarrass myself. Gantik Bayar Magnai. Is that, did I pronounce that right? Well, you got it right. I mean. <laughs> yes. Uh, and you are from Mongolia. Yes, I am from Mongolia. Yeah. I, that was like the first thing that caught me, right? Like Mongolia. I've had colleagues from Mongolia. Uh, but then Gantik had perfect English and he was there talking about, and then he was talking about energy, Mongolia, uh, how does energy and Mongolia came together. And then on top of that overlay that with blockchain, Yeah, I'm just thinking like, how did that all come together? And I didn't want to ask you any questions because if I was going to ask anything, I want it to be recorded and I want it to be shared with a wider audience. And so we're, yeah, I'm so excited to be here because there's so much about like that, <laughs> I mean, this is a totally new open field. I'm really excited because, you know, the limited knowledge that I have about, you know, black crypto in Mongolia, you know, and, and just fed some of the information, you know, not too long ago. And I'm then we are like excited. blockchain Asia, right? So yeah. how, a- how much Asia are we covering? Mongolia. <laughs> Welcome to the studio. Welcome to Singapore, too. Thank you. This Thank is you not guys. your first time to Singapore, right? No, not my first time. Uh, yeah. A couple of times before. Was it weird to you that I just kind of very thick skin came over to you and said like, hey, do you want to come on the show? <laughs> no, I mean, uh, there was a lot of interesting um, people that I met today. So, okay. but when you came up, I was I was a bit surprised, but then I was, you know, I'm eager to do these type of things. So, very happy. Was I the only podcast host though? <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> fortunately, yeah. I'm that competitive, I like to be unique in that, <laughs> in that way. So uh, no, so but then you are uh, you are a COO and co-founder for this company called Carbon, mm-hmm. right? And Carbon essentially it's um, looking at pre- at the projects and supply of um, the you know how does that connect you together with blockchain industry? So could you give us a bit of an introduction about your company? Uh, sure. Uh, just before uh, going into that, um, I was on on the way here in a taxi, and a taxi driver. We you know we struck a conversation talking about. Uh, Mongolia, Bitcoin, blockchain, and everything, and so he was asking me. <coughs> so does Mongolia have uh, buildings? You know, and <laughs> why yeah. does like, he think that it's like all this greenery exactly, and like, like people it, running around the green? I mean, it's not. I mean, it's it's not a wrong thing, but I mean that's the image when people think about Mongolia is people yeah, riding okay. horses and kind of like so Ireland. on. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and I mean I used to get this question when I went to high school in America as well, and. <laughs> So, but, you know, I'm used to it. I'm not, I don't get offended or anything. But <laughs> so his question was, you know, do you guys have, uh, do you live in a building? Is it, in, is it, you know, is it built with cement? So on, right? So, I mean, that's understandable because similar to you guys, you know, you guys were interested because, you know, this guy coming out of Mongolia and talking about blockchain and so on. Mm. And no one knows about the blockchain scene in Mongolia because no. it never gets talked about. I mean, and I think it's similar, uh, Mongolia is similar to other countries. Smaller countries like Mongolia don't get a lot of exposure because of the market itself is very small, not a lot of people doing it. Um, but hopefully we could change that one step at a time. So like today and you are to changing you guys, it, yeah. yeah. Well, one thing that I'm also really excited about is because, you know, I, the knowledge of Mongolia to me, it's not about, you know, oh, do you have cement buildings or what, <laughs> you know, whatnot, but it is limited in the fact that, you know, I, I like to follow trends and, you know, aspirational trends especially in you know tech or the next generation of where you know things are going and so you know uh looking at uh hotels looking at the energy system looking at i mean even you know in uh the capital city you know the pollution is not so great and uh you know just things like that so i i tend to really get fascinated about um boom towns or dream, you know, uh, like your aspirational, uh, you know, where where the next best thing is going to be. And so here you are right here, right in well, person. I would, I would also say that, I mean, the fact ge- that geographically, right, you're surrounded by a lot of countries that historically have been sort of overshadowing 
uh, Mongolia as a nation. I mean, I, I was fortunate because I work in finance and we did um, look at raising bond money like for the government of Mongolia, for mm. the Central Bank of Mongolia. So f- in that aspect, I was somewhat um, exposed to it. But at large, I think the neighboring countries had a lot more in the political and media arena as compared to like Mongolia in itself. Mm-hmm. And this is some of the things that fascinated me. I mean, like we are in Singapore and block show was very much about like blockchain. Mm-hmm. Um, and th- yeah, th- right downstairs today, there was the natural gas energy um, summit as well. And upstairs was the blockchain ah. summit. And then I see like this guy who had both of them. <laughs> He said talking about it like and I'm like, oh, like, you know, you've got the energy sec, you know, the energy factor, which is super big. Um, I know nothing about the energy sector in Mongolia. I mean, we know about it here because Indonesia is a very big sort of exporter of energy. Mm. Singapore, we are a huge GDP factor comes out of the energy, you know, but like uh, Mongolia, could you just give us like a bit of background on that? Um, so basically, uh, you know, uh, me and myself, I just started getting into blockchain stuff last year and, um, you know, we started trading. Uh, there's not, a, not a, a lot of people, uh, there's no companies out there doing classes or no, nothing like that. So I started um, giving small lectures, these classes to regular people. Um, Where about? Um, in, in, so it's in the capital city, uh, Ulaanbaatar. Okay. Um, and... I started giving these uh, classes to people, and be- this is before the December boom, right? Mm-hmm. So the first classes, you know, five, ten people maximum, and then I would talk about what is Bitcoin, why it was created. Um, so way down to like the fundamentals of yeah, like, like how do you, how you buy it, how you sell it, how you you know cash in, cash out, those type of things. Mm. And how and do th- what do people care about? Well. I mean, obviously, it's I think it's same way, uh, same all around the world. Money is involved. Mm. People like money, you know. So um, I think there was a lot of um, enthusiasm um, in uh, people that they wanted to make quick crash, quick cash in uh, investing Bitcoin. So it was mainly like the crypto space and the trading aspect of it. That's how it started off. Okay. So. I started off with doing that and we, you know, we got, you know, we got pretty big. We were covered by the national media, you know, we did events, uh, it was getting pretty big and the boom, you know, went up to 20,000, everyone was going crazy. Mm -hmm. When was that? So this is December. So we started in August and then until, yeah, right before, right before. How was the, the, because one of the biggest challenges that we had, especially early last year, right, Mm -hmm. was about like connecting the wallets to the bank accounts. Mm. Um, A lot of that system still had a lot of friction. How was the situation um, over there? So from a legal standpoint, it's everything is, uh, there's, there's no prohibitions, there's no blocking or Mm. anyone doing anything. And, very open so uh, this companies uh, they started a cryptocurrency exchange website called trade.mn and they asked me to get on board to be their first CEO so we started operating on October 1st of last year okay okay and um, you know it was was working okay Um, not a whole lot of volume but it was very for personal type trading so people would and invest hundred dollars, two hundred dollars, something like that. It's not nothing big, and the the exchange still operates today. Um, there's not a whole lot of traffic going on in Mongolia right now because, and the market itself is not helping. Mm, yeah. Um, but back since then, you know, I always wanted to get involved. Um, you know, start a project from scratch, and and always had this mind of how we could utilize Mongolia itself. You know, what Mongolia has to offer. What can we bring to the table, right? And we thought about, you know, Singapore, we thought about Switzerland, and everyone has something to offer, right? Um, Taxes, uh, you know, regulations, you know. um, And Mongolia had uh, not a lot of regulation, but then we uh, we didn't have the enough uh, human resources to develop blockchain, right? We yeah. only have three million people, so there's not a lot of uh, blockchain developers. So we kind of you know uh, list out everything, crossed you know whatever we couldn't do, and uh, we came down to uh, energy. 
So that's uh, one of the reasons was because Mongolia is very uh, resource rich. Yep. So we have a lot of resources, right? Um, Mongolia is the second mo least densely populated country in the world. 1.9 person per kil kilometer square. So we have a very big land, right? Yeah. Um, and our economy is, economy's backbone is the mining industry. Mm. So we said, you know, we have a lot of coal. Uh, we have a lot of wind, a lot of sunny days. You know, what we could, what could we do that makes fina uh, financial sense, right? So we said, there's a lot of coal uh, mines. Uh, maybe we could utilize them, you know. Maybe we could, um, so the motto was we could sell our coal through a fiber optic. So what it means is we could build a power plant that's, you know, uh, that uses coal, right? And then... But then now a lot of pullback on, like, power plants, um, sort of buildings and all of that. Um, a lot of countries are pulling back on that. Did you also look at We that? We did. I mean, it's, it's not a very pleasant thing to talk about, definitely. I mean, with the carbon footprint and all of uh, running a uh, coal power power plant is not a ideal... Um, uh, situation that we I mean yeah. uh, we want to be in but uh, from a business perspective we have to make sense yeah. uh, for investors and for users and and so on so you know we have to start somewhere so that's where we put the start line is um, use that call and then the next steps would be more green more ec um, eco friendly but um, if we start with the eco-friendly green projects, uh, it's going to be very expensive and it's not ideal for investors. So, you know, the first project has to be a success story for Mongolia because we don't, you know, I don't want Mongolia to be labeled as a uh, uh, scam type, of, you know, place that people, you know, take your money and run away type of place, mm -hmm. you know. So we want to make a statement that Mongolia is a place where you could actually do business that's very legitimate, that's credible, um, and you could build trust. And I think it's, uh, today in this day uh, of uh, internet, uh, news spreads very fast. Mm -hmm. So uh, we can't uh, lose that um, chance of, you know, representing Mongolia, especially the first project going, coming out. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, representing us. So that's why I joined it. Um, it's probably not the best uh, place that I want to be in, but I think um, financially and going forward, it makes sense. We're, we're right next to China. Um, you know, our, one of our plans is to build um, a lot of uh, facilities to um, have processing power, mm. mining, uh, data centers. So basically... Um, in the next 10, 20, 30 years, China is going to be consuming a lot of processing power. Mm -hmm. um, so that energy, is it going to be consumed locally or are you looking at uh, exporting uh, to China or well, to our neighboring countries? So basically, we're going to build a park that will have all kinds of facilities, right? Data centers, crypto mining. I mean, the whole, uh, yeah. the whole blockchain, I mean, everyone talks about decentralization, having, you know, um, these nodes everywhere all around the world the you know consensus all this stuff but they always will have to use some type of energy source right yeah, yeah. and to, to run up right? or mining right that's very uh, exactly. uses a lot of uh, bitcoin <laughs> yeah for example yeah. bitcoin would always rely on mining yeah mm -hmm. and even though the and uh, so much energy that's why one of the ba sort of the five backs against like how is it worth all that energy to become a miner. <laughs> well, but here's we've got this now this situation, uh, you know, in Mongolia, it's so resource rich, so energy rich, you know, wind rich and yep. coal rich, you know, and yeah. you can, you know, you can process that into, you know, mining yep. and, uh, you know, where they're having a lot of difficulties, especially in China and larger cities and how to, you know, mine. Everything's, you know, happening where where there is more. In terms energy. of like the resources that you spoke about and we're looking at like all the different energy sources, right? Did you, out of all the sort of green energy, um, sort of um, coal, and then you've got um, natural gas, all of that different type of options, ultimately, what does where does Mongolia like produces the most? Is there coal, or is there a, is there like a variety of the coal? Basically, we're run by coal. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, that's that's part of the problem as well. Is, is 
probably one of the most polluted cities in the world. Um, you know, it sucks to have uh, you know kids being raised in a in a in a city where you, you almost can't see you know ten meters front of you because of how bad the smog gets in the winter time. Um, and that's due to coal, basically, because people still living in small uh, we call them gears. Mm -hmm. So it's a yurt type thing uh, that you know this is an old nomadic. Uh, uh, I mean, we all we we lived. Uh, Genghis Khan lived in it yeah. back in the days, and we still there's people still living in it, and it's powered with a s stove that uses coal and yeah. produces a lot of uh, pollution, and not a good thing. Um, but a large because the population isn't that big, right? So how much pollution is how how significant is it with a three million population? Is we I'm comparing that with certain parts of China where <laughs> you know like they have very overpopulated density very dense cities and then consuming coal in those cities will have much bigger sort of consequences as compared to like well i think though in perspective if you look at it i mean because it is the geographical location and what's happening you know across the desert and the sands and that with the you know in addition to coal so i mean there are other factors as well so yeah you know. i mean um I, I mentioned we have a uh, very big land. We don't have, uh, you know, our population is only three million. Uh, but there's this also underlying problem is that about half of the population lives in the capital city. Yeah. Oh. Um, so our pollution mainly concentrated in like yes, the capital. Okay. Just in the capital city, and you, you drive out five kilometers out of the city freshest air you could ever breathe so yeah, yeah. I, was, I was looking at some of the maps uh one of my friends was moving to and i can't pronounce yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know you we were talking about because uh he was going to open up you know a large hotel or her, her his her partner um but you know it is like literally five kilometers out where you mm -hmm. have that you know complete fresh air mm -hmm. you know, i just the, I mean, the city's size is is not that big as well i mean probably similar to singapore Mm. Um, so half of the population is packed in there and a um, very big chunk of the population still lives in the yurts that use coal to power their gear, um, homes, uh, heat their homes. So, um, you know, the government's been trying to uh, fix this issue for a few years, uh, for a lot of years now. And, um, you know, they're building apartments um, instead of, you know, moving out the people from the districts um, and trying to change that. It, it, it'll take time, um, but I'm very uh, optimistic that, um, you know, w that will change in the future. So yeah. I wanted to go back and, you know, talk about you were, you went and you decided that you were going to teach regular people about the exchange of crypto, you know, I mean, through your exchange, I mean, because this is basically the entry point for a lot of, uh, people who aren't aware, you know, mm -hmm. especially right before the boom, you know, there yeah. were a lot of us that unless you were tech, you know, uh, which I'm making an assumption that a lot of people that probably weren't. Mm -hmm. But, you know, how did I mean, that sounds exciting in itself. But you go through and you taught, you know, you went through and you educated, you said five, ten people at a time. Are there success stories from that? Uh, are there, you know, you basically have created a group of people that are now more enlightened and, uh, and aware mm. um yeah i mean uh, you know I, I never thought of myself as a as a liberal but um you know i when i watched uh, i watched some documentaries on bitcoin and blockchain and one of the most um most the biggest effect on me had was uh, banking on bitcoin yeah. it's a pretty good uh quality very good documentary right and it kind of fascinated me that um you know how the central banks work, how, you know, how Bitcoin is trying to uh, revolutionize the whole, uh, the, the money, the money yeah. system that the uh, that humans have lived through for so many years, so many centuries. Um, you know, going back to the Mongolians, the Mongols using paper currency, mm. right? Yeah. Um, it, it was very fascinating because uh, when uh, paper currency for, uh, was first introduced um it was before Mongols took over China, so the Chinese actually first made it. Then the Mongol ruler in China was the first who actually had it used throughout the nation, right? Yeah. And Mongol What were they using before that? 
So uh, was everywhere. it gold or yeah, like silver, uh, copper? You know, because exactly China in ancient anything. time, very very ancient ancient time, they used to see use um seashells. Mm-hmm. And then essentially kind of evolves yeah. into like stones. You know, throughout history, you look at different countries. Everyone used different, some type of um, rare or valuable item as yeah. a currency, right? And Marco Polo, you guys know Marco mm-hmm. Polo. Yeah. Marco Polo, when he went back to uh, Venice, he went back to Venice, Rome. Yeah. Um, he said, you know, he was fascinated how these people treated this paper as real money. You know. And they thought that was so strange, so out of this world. You know, that's how they reacted to to the change. Um, and I think you know, whenever there's this he- uh, big uh, change uh, comes, a lot of people react negative, and that's what ne- Bitcoin, you know, kind of went through, right? Well, uh, I think even before that, right, when digital currency came into play, like that was like, how can you trust a number in the bank account, right? And before that, we had just like what you said, like money being in paper, um, you know, and when they were, it wasn't pegging to the gold and it was the peg to the gold. Like it had to go through several cycles of um, sort of pushbacks and questioning and whatever used to be ridiculous today we treat it as a norm. And so the crypto space was kind of like went through that wave. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I, uh, you know, I, I I was always the type to question things. <laughs> yeah. Um. So I said, you know, you, 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 these governments, central go- banks, they you know print money these days. You know, there's no gold back in them. And I started questioning it. I started talking about it, and that's what I talk about in my classes as well. Mm. So people, I try to let them understand why, instead of how much money you can make. How political um, do you get? I mean, <laughs> I I get to a point where, uh, and I I, I mention what the Mongolian Central Bank did a few years back as well. Um, they did something uh, similar as to how Americans print money these days. <laughs> but uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a very uh, sensitive topic. You know, politics, you, when you get into politics, you know, it's... But it's very real. I mean, we're not just looking at from the political angle, right? We also look at it from the financial angle, from the economics angle, and where um, too much power is essentially being given to a particular um, a, a organization mm. which has the decision to create um, more sort of inflationary or deflationary situation in an economy. In the case of Germany, for example, where they went through these um, huge hyperinflation um, and um, parts of Africa are still trying to recover from those kind of yeah. like inflationary economies. I think that economies that are starting to bring themselves together they they can learn from those mistakes and look at how do they how can they better position themselves and we in large we've seen a lot of nations a lot of jurisdiction coming together those later adopters where they don't face that much um, pushback by by larger organization or gov- governmental agencies to adopt new technologies a lot faster so fintech for instance is a lot faster in nigeria or parts mm-hmm. of africa yeah. i would assume it's not that different from Mon- in mongolia where blockchain when it was first introduced you don't have that much pushback from the bigger players no i mean y- not a lot of people are aware of um, not a lot of people understand how it works, you know, and that's you know, when I actually go um, and do, do my cl- uh, classes and lectures, I, I ask people, right, do you actually know how the Internet works? Mm. Do I they mean, know what the Internet, like a large, how many, like uh, what is the, is, is there a huge population of, um, of, of the uh, outside of the capital that actually do use Internet as well? Yeah, I mean, Internet is a very... Uh, it's very available now yeah. to everyone. So yeah. um, it's used. Uh, Facebook is one of the most used applications over there. Uh, everyone has a Facebook from eight year olds to 80 year olds. So outside of the uh, cabinet, like across yep. the board, across yep. the yep. nation. Yep. Yep. But now I want to get into this, uh, this article that we brought up, you know, that you had uh, brought up for us. It talks more about, you know, your vir- virtual currency in Mongolia and also is, you know, taking a look at, you know, how Mongolia has adopted you know, this has gotten uh, so their society ready for, um, you know, for the adoption. And then looking into candy, and I was looking at, you know, because this is new to me. So I'd love it if you could talk a lot about that. So uh, basically, it's not a real, it's not a blockchain-based cryptocurrency or anything. Mm-hmm. Um, it's uh, it's a company, telecommunications company, uh, 
the, the largest telecommunications company in Mongolia. So they had this loyalty type rewards type program, uh, which you know you get you receive after you pay your bills, you know some points, and then you could use it for uh, payments. Um, uh, but the law didn't. Um, so there was this new law that was passed by the central uh, by by the government that allows companies to have these type of uh, real money. Mm -hmm. So before then, it was you could actually use about. Uh, for example, you could pay your bill. If your bill was $100, mm. you could pay up up until $50, and you could use your uh, collected rewards points as payment. But the new law stated that you, you could get, go actually up to 100%. You could pay $100, $100 the whole of your bill with the rewards points that you collected. Um, it's it's one of the only uh, stories that came out of Mongolia to be on Coin Telegraph. It's one of the reasons I actually um, you know I wanted to talk talk to you guys today about it because uh, it definitely shows the government is 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 open minded. Um, they want to be progressive. They want to be they want to enable uh, companies and individuals to uh, the use of technology to uh, better um, benefit for the customers basically. Mm -hmm. So. Um, it's a it's definitely a stepping stone into where we're actually going um, on the whole of blockchain cryptocurrency the the government is not really against it um, the government is they're not fully supporting it they're not going out there and saying oh we you know we want you know binance to come open up your offices here they're, they're not doing that but mm -hmm. but they're not going to block it they're not how, gonna how knowledge anything. is the government and and how involved are they because one there's a difference between being like um against it because they they uh, they know the threats and the consequences of or the opportunities right and the other difference would be they just have no clue what it is right. and so like yeah. what is there for us to do if we don't know anything about it so, I mean, that's what uh, I was I was talking I was saying earlier uh, you know when I ask people how do you do you know with the internet you know how does it work not a lot of people know how it, the internet works, yeah. but we use it every day, right? But people come up to me and ask how blockchain works. You know, like, how does it work? What is it? You know, like, um, majority of the people, um, I feel that they don't really need to know. I mean, I think it's, um, you know, maybe some people who are really interested, they should know, but it's not f for every person that, you know, you, you dig deep into it, how, how the technology works, how every you know pu puzzles come together right but mm. the most important part is what you could actually do with it that's what i try to explain so um the government um uh, officials a lot of people a lot of agencies I, I i talked to you know they took they got my advice they they sought my advice as well um, are you like one of the advisors at the national level <laughs> no no <laughs> not really no I'm, I'm just uh I, I try to be the translator for the regular people okay uh basically what it means is you know you know we talk about all this financial stuff going on around the world hyperinflation all this stuff the regular joe does not understand that yeah. and you know they don't understand why the money in their pocket is deflate over deflate, that, yeah. you know in in one year eight percent ten percent right yeah um and they don't really took you know they don't really think too much about it all they care about is you know work um their family you know what's important to them right but then you know the money that they buy bread um you know is getting expensive year by year and they don't understand what's going on behind it i try to do explain they, to them do why they this is happening do they appreciate that they need to know that though because something that they a dollar that they could have bought like a, a, a bread right it would not be able to afford that same bread next year anymore do they understand that basic concept though I mean, obviously they do understand the, the basic co concepts of it they understand it but when you go into detail on how it, you know how you fix that how it happened who did it what's going on and people use all these you know words you know all these uh you know sophisticated words and, pe and the regular joke doesn't understand that which you know? people want to use it to confuse you and like you know it's exactly how you, you watch a movie you know like the big short right yeah. yeah it's a very good movie right mm. and then they they talk exactly uh, very similar thing cdos they call all these things with complicated names and 
because the regular people should not understand it. That's why they call these these you know these names. Very and very good point because this article <laughs> the heading is central bank gives permission to issue first digital currency. What does gives permission means? Like, did they require permission to begin with? If they didn't understand it. What type of permission are we talking about? Is to me when I'm reading this, like the article in itself doesn't say that much, and I think it's a r- great example of what is happening a lot in the space of the sort of introduction of new technology because mm-hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a combination of what you said, right? You either use very complex wording or you use very generic uh, marketing. It's sort of like you go to a supermarket and you buy like detergent that is 25% cleaner, but then you're like 25% cleaner than what? Than what, yeah. And so I'm, uh, my question to here would be like, what permission w- did it exactly have to give? Well, uh, basically the company uh, could use their points to buy things as if it was real money. Mm-hmm. So this it's the first one. So they, they enable that facility to, to do that transaction and Legal. convert fiat into, um, fiat into uh, tokens. Mm-hmm. Is that what it is? So, I mean, they had the technology, but it was not legally possible before, right? You could not actually change your rewards points to a, uh, a fiat. Was it illegal? A free flight though? or a coffee yeah. or... Yeah, just yeah. things like that, yep. right? But That's was it illegal, it was. though? It was illegal. Oh. So it was illegal. Okay. It, it's not, you know, it can't, it can't be 100%. Um, so one for one, you can't change it. Okay. Or you could actually use it, or for fifty cents value of something that you're buying, you could use those points. So okay. that's how it was before. But now you could actually buy the whole thing with your with your uh, with your points. You know, w- with your phone. You just and they coffee. started recognizing wallets, which they didn't before, cri- like crypto wallets and stuff like that. Mm. Yeah, I think those are probably some of the permissions that were sort of enabled yeah. after they they opened up, right? Um, just one thing that I, you know, me being a liberal, <laughs> I think, <laughs> um, you know, it's it, it's it's a company controlled uh, currency. So um, I'm not sure how good that's going to be. Um, you know, the, the company controls how much um, these uh, digital currencies out there. Uh, how it will fluctuate and how much will be. Released. I mean, the central bank's probably going to monitor it, but it's I'm not sure if. Giving another uh, company uh, entity the permission to print money is, is a good thing. Yeah, ah, I'm okay. not. I'm not two hundred percent. I'm not hundred percent on that. Um, you know, but they have good intentions. That's the thing. That's the one thing that I'm. Um, I'm happy about is they have good intentions. They want people to use digital currencies more. Mm-hmm. Inst- you know, going away from real currencies and. Um, in Mongolia, being a small country, these things spread very quickly. They adapt very quickly. So, a few years back, people would line up at the bank because they don't trust, you know, uh, mob- like mobile uh, phone applications or the usage of uh, like ATMs. Or I mean, ATMs were okay, but mostly people would tend to go in person to send money, receive money, do those type type of things. And in a matter of ten years now, you know, you go to a black market, you go to, you go anywhere, the you, you all you could always pay with uh, through mobile uh, phone applications and so on. So we're we're changing very quick, and I think the this company wants to be ready for that change. Yeah. Um, and they wanted to have uh, the government's back uh, backing before yeah. they do it. So I guess they're uh, from a big corporation like them it's it's a good way to start um uh, making these changes is starting with the regulation first the law first so and that is something that fascinates me a lot because when it comes from the central bank's perspective right it's all about having that grasp of your monetary policies Mm -hmm. your money the value of your country because that is essentially what determines how much your gdp is and what are your export prices and your import prices you manipulate a lot of that through rises you know monetary policies Mm -hmm. and fiscal policies but in this particular case once you allow crypto sort of to come into play, mm. it throws everything off because now it's on the World Wide Web and it's not a value that you can contr- con- you can manipulate or you can control. In the case of the US, for example, where they went into QE, quantitative easing back then, mm. um, and then now they're sort of coming back to tapering. I'm wondering how will the government of Mongolia sort of play around this, this space, allowing the crypto to sort of start to be traded freely? 
I think, uh, in my honest opinion, they're, uh, they're not going to do anything about it for a while. Okay. Um, I th they have a lot, of, lot on their plate. Um, so uh, it's, not a, it's, not a, it's not a big of a headache for them. The there are moment. bigger issues in the, in the pipeline to deal with. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, inflation, I was looking, it's, uh, it's quite high. And it is. Year on year. And I, th that's the problem. Is like, that's what I want to talk about is people think that's the norm, yeah. you know, and it shouldn't be, you know. What is inflation in Hawaii? It's, a, uh, it's expected to be stabilized around 8.0% next year. So Stabilized at 8.0%. Yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. So, you know, it's... What is the the central bank interest rate? Uh, I have no idea right now. Because yeah. at eight percent inflation, I think they said eleven percent was what I was looking at. Because there was a report that just came out, uh, you know, looking at that they're expecting the economy to grow. Uh, the central bank uh, is, you know, expecting the economy to grow from five percent to about eight and a half percent. But then, if you have an eight percent inflation rate, how much do you math. have to grow to catch up to that? So translating that to the average person, you know, that's yeah. kind of interesting to in, in favor of some, you know, use of. Uh, so so here's the thing: yeah. how the average, um, so in Mongolia, the average sort of um, um, consumer, where do they keep their money? Is yeah. Do they keep it in the bank account? Because in India, for example, they have a inf high inflation and interest rates are super high as well. But most at large, they don't really keep money in the bank account, right? They keep money in other means. How, how is the situation in Mongolia? Um, yeah, local banks, basically, uh, mostly. Um, the, the whole financial, I mean, Mongolia was, uh, was a Soviet state, right? Uh, yeah. It was under the Soviet, I mean, it was a, like a satellite Soviet state. We were independent, but we were basically run by the Soviets. Uh, in 1990 to 1990, we got you know democracy. You know, mm -hmm. um, we're a very young demo uh, democratic country. So um, this, some of these things change very slowly because we still have people from that um, era mentality, right? That, that era, the socialist you know mm -hmm. mentality, where you know, there's only one bank, there's only it's the state owns everything type right. of thing, right? Yeah. Um, it's, it's not a bad thing or anything, but uh, people do have to understand that democracy and capitalism is, is a totally different system and people, you just don't sit around and wait for the government for a payout, right? But we still have so many people with uh, that kind of mentality. You know, they um, think the government will, uh, government, you know, owns these mining companies, owns these banks, and then with the profits, they, you know, pay out the citizens. And, it's it's well it's it's not the case, but the politicians make it the case. That's the problem. Yeah. It's like they would say, "Oh, this is owned by the country, owned by the people. You get a share, you get a dividend, and, and just doesn't work out as you know as how they picture it. You know, they they paint it a very nice picture, but then it doesn't really translate on the, on the for the regular people. And this is oftentimes what we see in a lot of like post-Soviet, post-communist yeah. countries, right? Where you see a lot of like state-owned um, sort of o the ownership is there, mm -hmm. and you still uh, even after those kind of the, um, the, the the liberation so-called, they will still be uh, a large being owned by in the f hands of few. But then the question is, what about liabilities? What about responsibilities? Do they also um, keep up to the same level of responsibility and fulfillment as? a socialist and communist country will, will need to meet because if they own all of these assets, they also have to be responsible for, for pretty much everybody else's um, welfare. It has to be equal. Do they, have they completely detached and they just want to take, you know, take the good things and like, you know, allow everybody to sort of go through the bad, bad aspect of it? No, I mean, it's, it's not that, it's n maybe I, I'm talking in a very bad, uh, you know, <laughs> sense, but it's I like mean, it's a high level <laughs> economics <laughs> course for yeah. us. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, we, we, uh, Mongolia is uh, the people. I mean, we're, we're very optimistic, right? Yeah. We, we, the politicians, and the politicians everywhere are the same, I think. Um, and you know, we, we're, we're just going over a rough patch, mm. is yeah. how I see it. Um, you know, our government, uh, well, um, our economy is basically, uh, you know, Mining, right? And in 2011, 2010, 11, 12, uh, we were one of the fastest growing economies in the world. You know, we were generating a lot of cash. Mm. 
because of the mining boom uh, and the the commodity prices were going up, uh, it, was a, it was a very good time for us. There's a lot, so much construction going on yeah. around the capital city. Yeah. You know, things are changing. You know, international brands coming. The economy is, you know, very visibly changing. Is that what a large people are optimistic over there? Like, the, are they? Um, is it is it a general optimism in terms of how the where the direction of the country is heading and how the e- economy is going to be booming? I mean, it's it's a Mongolian uh, mentality, I guess. I mean, we're not uh, like a warrior type of mentality that we have. Uh, we're not gonna just stand down and. Uh, take it in the you know take it in the <laughs> face and do nothing about it you know uh, we're obviously uh, changing at a very quick rate so that's one of the things about Mongolia is very quick to adapt um, that's I mean traditionally we're nomadic people and nomadic people are always good at adapting there's to never things. like a fixed situation a exactly. fixed place right exactly. and that is the type of mentality the type of culture that you wa- do you would want and you kind of want to see in uh, a crypto uh, blockchain space Mm -hmm. because the first adopters generally tend to be those visionaries, people that have, uh, are not used to the norms, are not not used to just being um, in one single place. They wanna see change progressively. And we, it kind of sounds like, I mean, I don't, I've never been to Mongolia, but from the description, it kind of sounds like you have the hunger, Mm -hmm. that need, that urgency because of the state of the economy coming out of the Soviet Union. But at the same time, because of the culturally, you guys are very quick to adapt. You're nom- nomadic. Um, it does um, technology, new technology, is essentially just another form of um, your your social and, and living state. I like that. I like that. Um, you know, taking away these uh, these really good positives about you know the the people, the culture, the the hunger behind you know mm-hmm. this space. You know, I like that that you're. What we got so fortunate by having one of the people that's it, educating uh, everyone about this. What do you think the next, is a year too long projection? Uh, next six months to a year would be for the space in Mongolia? Um, you know, I, I, I attended an event in, um, in uh, we call it UB for sure. It's easier to pronounce. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so in UB, uh, so this is a company that I used to work with. Very good people, hardworking. They're one of the pioneers. They um, they supported me when I started doing my classes. They actually took me on ab- uh, on board as their uh, CEO w- at one of their projects. So they're actually working on a, uh, uh, a blockchain platform. So they're going to release their own version of a platform where they could uh, offer services for the healthcare, for the education system. So basically, it's the, it's the most simple things that we could u- utilize blockchain for. So every person has their own identity number right and you could yeah. you could use it in the healthcare system as you know if you go to a state hospital or a private hospital you know put you put in your identity uh, number n- and you have your um, uh, medical history so that's one of the things that blockchain is very good for utilizing right yeah. um, um, you know diplomas you know <laughs> cl- uh, recording diplomas on, um, on so blockchain traceability is and uh, um, authenticating yeah Where basically how big is the blockchain ecosystem over there? Well, I mean, there's none, basically, there's none. right? I mean, there's, I mean, this is the first one, basically. Um, mm-hmm. So we are, we're, we're here to, uh, uh, like, our, my company is more, uh, very simple. You know, we're not, we're not promising to do something amazing, and you know, we're going to release this main net in 2020. We're not doing that. We're just making, uh, trying to do something simple, um, and make it a success, so that we could build the path to uh, to make make it possible to build that something amazing. One step at a right? time. Mm-hmm. Because we can't be, uh, you know, we just can't start from nothing to being the best in the world, right? Mm. But we have to uh, start somewhere, and that's where I am right now. But then we have this other company. In the next six months, I think they're gonna have their um, like testnet on, you know, in a couple of years, they'll try to integrate uh, a lot of government agents, private companies, banks, however much they could get their hands on, they, they're going to try to uh, put them on their platform. So that's, I think it's a good thing that they're doing because they're not thinking about money first, I don't think. So yeah. that's, that's a good thing. Yeah. So what brings you to Singapore? 
And what are you hoping to, who are you looking to get connected and what would it, what are you looking to acquire while you are here? Um, Singapore is becoming a hub, right, in Asia, basically. Um, everyone's coming to Singapore because of um, the regulations, very lax. Um, you know, financially, it's a very uh, good place for businesses to operate out of. Uh, a lot of companies yeah. very are moving to Singapore from overseas and um, a lot of uh, ICOs, a lot of uh, blockchain events do happen here. And, um, you know, I think Singapore could be the Asia's hub for blockchain or crypto space in the future. I mean, it, it's becoming one, um, even though South Korea and Japan has been very active. Mm. But they've been, I, you know, compared to Singapore, they've been more in their own local scene. More. Right. You know, they're, right. they're getting, they're so big, but they always are in their own little own markets. They're huge. But Singapore is, you know, I, I always thought Singapore as like the future city, right? It's because it's so diverse, it's so um, well connected. It's, you know, you have so many different ethnicities living in one place and um, it's a very, uh, the whole the whole culture is so open like that. So I think it's perfect for, because Asian countries you know, you, you go to America, Americans are not, they don't, they don't really, you they're know. They're very nationalistic. They're very, right. like, pretty much in their, like, adaptable. view a <laughs> war around it. They don't know. <laughs> like, they don't know, like, I mean, it's not, it's not their fault or anything. I mean, it's, we have so many different countries in Asia. Like, when, when I used to live in America, right, in the U.S., um, you know, Asians would be fighting each other, you know, because we had, there's so many different, you know, people. And then, but, you know, all, other people would look at it as as you guys are all Chinese, you know. Yeah, that's I mean, true. Yeah. To be to be honest, right? We have so uh, many ethnicity, but then like from other countries, they look at us it's like, oh, so you all Asian. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, um, Singapore is a very good hub um, to you know be to build an international. Um, in between the Asian countries. But how do you see that influencing and uh, or or even helping Mongolia? Because you came here to get more resources and to meet more people and how can singapore sort of have an have a um, sort of help other asian nations um not just mongolia but like i think from your experience especially coming here a lot of what you are doing what you experience it could help other countries as well um for example the government here supports it mm. the yeah. research of blockchain the, you know they they uh, they're very in, uh, very open in supporting this new industry, this new technology, this new market. So I think some countries need to learn from that. Um, Mongolia, for example, uh, we, we are, you know, in the next two years, we're probably not going to be the, uh, we're, we're not probably not going to have any laws or anything like that, but then we're not gonna be like Singapore, or we're not gonna be like China, um, you might define your own sort of situation, your your own economy. And to do that, we need to look at other countries who are you know who've been been doing it, so s with some experience, right? Um, and I think Singapore can be a very good example for us to follow. Yeah. Um, um, how open and how supportive of you guys have been on this whole scene. So I think that's a it's a good thing to uh, for us to learn from. Hopefully, um, I don't know. Maybe when you in a couple in a next year, you'll be. Are you? Do you see yourself going getting more involved with politics and uh, the finance sector? Are they coming to you and seeking for more advice and seeking for more sort of resources? I mean, uh, it, that's. I think it's everyone's. You know, who's a patriotic um, uh, individual would want to help their country mm -hmm. somewhere or another, right? Right. And my, you know, I've always had this vision. If I, you know, in the future, five, ten years from now, right? Um, you know, if I do have the time, um, the motivation to do things like that, then then I would really do it. I gladly do it. Um, but right now, it's more of a going back to how I could uh, change yeah. things, change people's minds. Um, you know, one thing about Mongolia, the, I mean, a lot of problems that I face in Mongolia is 
um, there's a lot of scammy coins mm. doing like you know MLL type coins. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you and you probably don't see them in Singapore, like Singapore. Oh or no, you see them. Yeah, I was gonna <laughs> say yeah, you do. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, but we we have a lot of them, right? And yeah. they raise so much money. They you know they run run away with money and. Um, and I try to speak uh, speak out against them, you know. Yeah. Not a lot of people speak out against them. That, that's the problem. I don't know why, but yeah, people don't talk about it. So I actually go to the press. I mean, not go to the press. I actually, you know, get on some like uh, online publications and give an interview. Yeah. Really get into, you know, how it's a scam. You know, I just outright say this is a scam. You know, and I get so much backlash for it as well. But uh, I think um, me of uh, you know understanding. Um, getting these uh, hateful comments, um, all these feedback, you know, I develop a thick skin. So maybe if I do get you a politician, that, well, you develop <laughs> a thought leadership in this space, right? So God knows we might be speaking to the future minister of crypto tokens and blockchain <laughs> yeah. in Mongolia, right? Um, yeah, I mean, the the government, current government, is trying really hard. I mean, yeah. they're they have uh, they're trying to. Uh, digitalize a lot of their work uh, they're uh, you know they're very progressive on that they're very uh, open to ideas they have a you know I think I think they have a blockchain committee as well I mean there's a couple of people on there advising them on what's happening you know oh, wow. what, what they should do um, Mongolia is a very small country I, I met with a couple member of parliaments talked to them about you know what I could bring to the table or how I could support them you know I could go to these ministers and you know give them lectures you know like tell them you know what's what's a scam what's not a scam at least you know and i think so. that's important also to know you know because um it may not appear what is a scam and what's not a scam if there's not that conversation happening or not the education happening that you're providing and you're bringing to not only you know you, you regular people but also to you know mps and you know other government leaders so i you know like gustavo said we might be talking to the next Prime Minister of uh, Blockchain. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Who knows? That might be an uh, or the energy blockchain sector. Yeah. Yeah, depending on how yeah. how the economy is driven. Who knows what might happen? So, <laughs> but yeah, thank you guys. <laughs> well, Antik, it's been a pleasure. Like I could, I I have so much I want to learn from you. I want to yeah. learn about the state of the economy. I want to learn about the pu people, the culture. Mm. Um, the food, especially, um, I think everybody loves food. Um, I'm just talking that for myself. <laughs> <laughs> but in terms of the national relationship, and I think Mongolia yeah. being intertwined with a lot of sort of political situations with China, mm. with all the neighboring country with Russia, um, it does, um, you know, it, it, it's very far from where we here in s the little sort of bubble that Singapore has formed for itself. Mm. Even just on the crypto space, I feel like we kind of live in our own little bubble. Mm, I, uh, I agree. I'll be yeah. able to hear from, I mean, we host every week and mm -hmm. we bring guests from different backgrounds, right? We had Magda last week that talked about Poland, right? And she gave us a very different perspective from that. And we think we are very fortunate today to have um, Gantik here on the show to talk about the state of the Mongolia blockchains um, environment. Heavy uh, energy resource. That's a pretty big takeaway. Yeah. And I, I wish you all the best of luck. Yeah. Please stay in touch. And when you come back to Singapore next time, we look forward to have a follow up with you on the show. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, uh, my pleasure. And uh, very appreciative of you guys having me. So I think it's good, a good exposure to everyone. Um, you know, we in be being connected. Um, like you said, I think every country has their own little bubble right now. Yeah. But, you know, the only people who's not in the bubble are people attending events like today's. Mm. But, you know, Mongolia has their bubble, you know, Eastern European countries that have their own America. Everyone has their own because the market itself, the communities are still small, I think. Yeah. And you still see, you still go on Reddit and see, you know, people posting stuff. And it's a very small community still. Yeah. So... In the next few years, I, you know, I, I hope the community, you know, grows and um, grows out of, um, you know, Reddits and, you know, those platforms because um, not everyone uses them. Yeah. You no. know, for mass adoption, I think it's it's going to be different in the future. So I hope for a bright future for everyone, Singapore, Mongolians and 
working together. And, well, for you know. podcasts, right? That is one way <laughs> of like getting resources outside of Reddit, yeah. um, <laughs> Facebook, <laughs> and all of that. So um, when we do go aired, mm -hmm. um, and when this goes live, I hope that um, more people get to hear what it is like in other ecosystems and in other yeah. countries. And hopefully you'll be able to take this recording and share it with the people in Mongolia. And likewise, we'd love to hear more about what's happening in that part of the world. I will. I will put it everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Thank yeah. you so much for Thank coming you. in. Thanks, yeah, for sharing your ideas and, and what you've been doing. It's pretty exciting. Thank yeah. you. Thank and you, guys. This was so Blockchain much. Asia. I'm here with Michelle Wonderland. And I'm your host, Gustavo Liu. And once again, thank you, Gatip, for being on the show today.